Uh, hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on your time zone. Uh, I'm <laughs> glad to be able to kick off our session on uh, in, uh, inducing a better future by funding innovation. Uh, and uh, here with us uh, today with a terrific group of uh, panelists uh, to have, I think, what will be a very vibrant uh, discussion. Uh, and I'm very excited for it. Uh, we're going to begin with some very brief introductions, which I will model, um, and then we'll get uh, into uh, some questions on this topic. I'm Oliver Libby. I'm the moderator for the session. Honored to be here. I'm the co-founder and managing partner of a venture studio and venture firm in New York called HL Ventures and City Rock Venture Partners, which focuses on investing and co-building in companies at the nexus of growth, impact, and diversity. Uh, and let me turn it over to uh, Angela. Do you want to uh, take over with a similar introduction? Oh, sure. Thank you. Uh, I'm Angela Huang, and I am the founder and president of Temple Bioscience. We are a biotech company um, based in San Francisco, and we work with um, specialized kinds of stem cells. They're called iPSCs, short for in inducible pluripotent stem cells. And they're derived from human blood and or skin. And the main purpose for scientists is that we work with them as disease models for pharmaceutical companies, preclinical drug development purposes and projects. And uh, another usage of these cells is to develop allogeneic stem cell therapies. So that's what we work with. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Constantine. Uh, hello, I'm Konstantin Morachov. Um, I'm originally from Ukraine, but based in Switzerland. I'm an entrepreneur and investor with a background in uh, economics and finance. Uh, currently, uh, I'm working on several projects uh, in the field uh, of agriculture, in particular HEM, and also in the field of um, artificial intelligence, uh, voice assistant, and, uh, and silver economy. Fantastic. Andrei? Uh, hi, everybody. I am Andrei Dovzhenko, managing partner of uh, SMRK VC fund based in Kiev, Ukraine. We mostly invest in Ukrainian startups uh, in the field of AI, SaaS, and uh, other uh, fields. Thank you so much. Uh, Tuam Yes, hello everyone. So my name is Thomas Rakat. I work at Huawei in business development and uh, my background is in, is in management consulting, startups and technology and software. And so uh, both uh, working with startups but also engaging through the eyes of a bigger platform. Fantastic. Thank you. And uh, Gary, why don't you bring us home with the no, thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is Gary Gaba. Uh, a quick background. Uh, before launching the CXO Fund, over the last 25 years, uh, I have bootstrapped and self-funded uh, and exited three companies. Uh, and after the third exit, uh, it was clear to me uh, I want to really help uh, the most disruptive founders uh, to co-innovate uh, startup companies uh, and invest in early-stage investors where the big difference between our fund and other funds is that uh, you have 100 plus CXOs of Fortune 500 companies who are investors uh, as LPs, and they get deeply engaged as we are in disrupting uh, some of the big, big business problems and curating companies as well. Fantastic. Well, thank you. So I think uh, for those who are with us in the room and those who will see this recording afterwards, uh, this is a, a really good panel, uh, particularly on this topic of uh, a better future by funding innovation. And uh, I want to start uh, by talking about some elements of the structure of how we fund innovation. And I think you've heard that there's several different structures represented on the panel today. Um, and, and this applies both to the corporate structures so funds, holding companies, uh, uh, corporate ventures, and also the models that we use and, and how these are changing. So my first question um, is, how do we see the models by which we fund innovation changing in this time? Um, and uh, let me uh, start actually with Constantine. Uh, we had a good conversation on this, and then we'll uh, hear from some. Uh, this is quite a broad question, and uh, but I will present my, my view. Uh, and again, I, I, I represent in two parts. I represent both uh, receiver of funds and giver of funds. Uh, 
And uh, probably here I will speak a little bit from a receiver of fund. funds. Uh, the biggest issue for the structuring that, you know, for young companies, innovation is very difficult to pierce through, uh, let's say, a veil where traditional VC operates uh, because uh, the real innovation is uh, uh, a lot of time is hidden in the things which are not fashionable. Yeah? And the biggest issue for VC is not to follow the herd, but to find, you know, these gems which might look quite unusual, not follow the trend, but they really create the changes. And uh, the big difference that uh, the current infrastructure of nurturing these good ideas is unfortunately not so effective. Of course, we have the system of uh, knowledge and technology transfer from universities, but uh, you know, universities, they always have specific paths for development. And uh, for people who come with good inventions, good uh, things which, which go a little bit uh, against the trend, it's not always easy to go and to reach the um, financing. And this also relates to networking. You know, we have some issues now with COVID, uh, but also relates to overall how the system is operated uh, because there is a lot of herd uh, behavior. And uh, for me, it's still a question how the investment would be effective and how it would be channeled in the right way and not follow the trend, which could be in a lot of cases hype. Yeah? Because uh, could, examples could be, you know, we don't discuss the effectiveness, let's say Bitcoin or crypto. Everybody wants to invest in crypto and everybody wants to invest in cannabis. But, uh, you know, we cannot follow the herd. And this is probably my biggest point here. For sure. Thomas, you come at this from the perspective of a large corporate, although you have lots of experience in this space. Are there ways in which the corporate world is changing the structures in which you? Well, uh, well, although many of the big platform companies fund innovations, uh, I think uh, I'd rather not comment from Huawei's perspective, uh, as as we tend to focus more on R&D and on doing a lot of the innovations in-house. But uh, in you know in general terms speaking, what I've I've seen that I think that the past five to ten years it's just been accelerating with uh, all of the acquisitions that large platform companies are doing, and also looking for synergies and accelerating the growth. It's just the fact that you know all of the things cannot be innovated in house. So I think that's one of the reasons that why the the top teams uh, get acquired. And I think that we've also seen this. Uh, in an accelerating space also here in the Nordics and Northern Europe. Uh, ma- many of the, especially I think US tech giants, but also uh, Asian and, and Chinese tech giants have been acquire- been on acquiring spree uh, the, the past years. Of course, it's great that because the capital markets here are historically a bit smaller compared to, let's say, the bigger European markets or then uh, US and, and Asia. So I think that that's like uh, helps to accelerate the best innovations uh, uh, in in the market. So I think I see it as, as a positive trend. For sure. Angela, uh, from Tempo Vine Science's point of view and also your experience in the, in the sector, um, are you noting also some structural changes in the way that we've been funding innovation since the, the 2008 crisis? Uh, is this is sector in motion? Not in a structural way. Um, I think... Funding a lot of times has been polarized, so some topics and some therapeutic areas get intense um, amount of attention, and other areas are almost as quiet as you can imagine for, for the VCs in terms of funding. So this is the biggest difference. I mean, there's some very hot topics like AI and other types of CAR-T therapies and um, other allogeneic therapies that get $100 million in Series A, for example, whereas there are lots of great ideas, smaller startups that are essentially uh, either not adequately funded for their Series A or B or um, sparsely funded. Yeah, so like $6 million, $8 million. So go ahead, please. Well, I was just going to say, just to, to quickly push on that for a moment, I've, I've noticed, and I'm no biotech expert, but uh, there's been a, a, um, 
a run up in, for example, large angel networks that are much more organized and able to support the early stages in companies across sectors. But I've noticed it, for example, uh, I think BioVerge is an example. Is that something that's just on the margins and not really moving the needle, do you think? Or is that a change that is making it easier, at least in the early stages? It it really depends on the topic for biotech always. Angel investors prefer to invest in devices rather than therapeutics because of timeline, cost, dilution to them and their funds, etc. So there are lots of considerations where there are preferences between different funding groups. Um, I think from our view for a VC fund, the question usually is about um, who are the LPs for the VC funds, what are the alignment issues that they discuss with their LPs? And how are these things handled? Because the VCs do come in when something is really in need of therapeutic push and development, and that requires really serious funding. I mean, it's the Series A's that are 100 million. I mean, great for the companies to really push the candidates into um more mature development and there are, you know, some AI companies in, in the space that raise, you know, $450 million in Series C. I mean, that's just a very humongous gap between companies that get funded and ones that, you know, receive only $6 million or less. Um, yeah, so there's polarized funding trends. Absolutely. Uh, Gary, it looked like you had a couple of thoughts and it looks like you also have a, a unique LP base. Am I right in that? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. You know, so uh, I'll be the contrarian out here. We use the term build and disrupt, right? Uh, and the typical VC model, uh, they love me for that. The spray and pay model needs to go away, right? Uh, it's all about uh, how you take a big business problem and how do you get uh, all the right people around it. So, uh, the model which we are kind of uh, 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 we have created is uh, one we have a pretty powerful CXO base uh, which ranges from the CTO, CIO, Chief Transformation Officer, Data Officer, CEO, CFO, you name it, of the Fortune 500 company, and then uh, strong emerging partnerships, universities, and labs. And as a part of uh, uh, the team, right, uh, there's some pretty strong people who have crazy amount of patents under him. So one is when we work with the uh, corporations, right, we'll take the business problem and uh, figure out what is that differentiated IP which we can uh, grab. Uh, you don't want to start building an MVP if you don't have the, the differentiated mm -hmm. IP or create a Fort Knox around it and then start figuring out who are the early co-innovation customers. Because having built three companies as an entrepreneur, we get emotional, we get excited, but let the market speak about uh, truly what is that business problem. It needs to be a large business problem, large TAM, and team and TAM are the two key things uh, you work around. And even if you look at, right, uh, with the crisis, we have gone through the pandemic over the last 18 months. Uh, there's crazy amount of uh, thinking and innovation which is emerging, and how do you get your arms around those business problems and uh, get the right set of uh, people? So that's what we call the build and disrupt. And then eventually, obviously, as you get uh, the V1 of the product out, right, uh, the work with the strategics uh, and uh, the VCs who will make sense. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, so that's uh, the model which we are uh, creating, and uh, we're excited about this journey. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up some of those VC orthodoxies. We're, we're going to come right back to that, Gary. Uh, but Andre, before we leave the structural topic, <clears throat> I think you sit in a, uh, a very interesting seat running <clears throat> a very successful shop that's not a U.S.-based VC, but you also have the perspective of working with the U.S. venture firms. Is there interesting innovation in the VC structure around the world that you're seeing, or are you seeing people stick mainly to the old um, I see only the old school approach, and I think that the old school is the best school because uh, we have all the instruments we need to p p provide uh, the, uh, the amount of c capital that the proper startup is needed. With uh, the same structure, you can do spray and pray or smart money. It's not about structure. It's about people. It's about... Uh, 
vision it's about your corporate or fund culture etc etc in the end of the line it's all about people if you have proper team if you have a proper vision the current uh, uh, pack of instruments uh, uh, which uh, we see is uh, fully equipped with is uh, enough in my opinion Sure. Well, good. We have a little bit of differentiation in the opinions of the panel, which is always my favorite thing. Um, Gary, I, I want to come back to something you said, which I think is really important. Uh, as a VC for myself, you know, over a decade, uh, there are certain um, orthodoxies or maybe mythologies that have popped up over the years, pattern recognition, unicorn hunting, uh, and others. And uh, I'm curious to know, because we're in a bit of a moment for venture funding by uh, of innovation, uh, you know, valuations of later stage deals are very high, lots of activity, lots of deal flow. Are these orthodoxies or uh, foundational mythologies still as relevant today? Are they working or are they standing in the way of innovation? You know, obviously, uh, you know, I would say the human psychology kicks in, right? Uh, and obviously, as uh, people, as investors, as we see, right, uh, all of us desire, okay, uh, you know, not only a unicorn, now you're hearing the new big term Decathlon, right? Um, how, how do you uh, get to that stage and uh, how do you predict? that some of these uh, companies will become uh, unicorns or eventually decathons, right? And that's what humans are, right? So that uh, will be their desire, but not the reality. I think we got to focus on the the basics, right? And uh, one of the things I mentioned, right, our investment philosophy uh, and broadly, uh, just not us, right, is all around team and time. And uh, you, you have to uh, focus on the business problem, and if it's a large enough addressable market, uh, you will hit the unicorn. Obviously, you know when you invest, right? <laughs> uh, your goal is how you can uh, disrupt and uh, make this company really big. But you you cannot forget the fundamentals uh, of uh, uh, solving that big business problem, figuring out the the right team. And a lot of the the founders and the where they can go wrong out of the gate is. Uh, if they don't have the right founding team and the right chemistry, uh, it can, you could be the smartest person on the earth, right? But uh, if you don't understand, right, how to work with your co-founders and the team members, uh, it, it'll be a disaster. Uh, and so, so some of those uh, elements become very critical. But at the same time, you know, as you are investing in these uh, companies and founders, uh, uh, it's very important that... Uh, the, the founding team understands uh, uh, things evolve and change. What worked in the past may not work today. Uh, so you go back to the Darwin theory, adapt, evolve, and thrive. And so those things become very important uh, versus just uh, zeroing in on the, uh, some of the myths. Uh, hopefully I answered your question. Yeah, no, and it's it's uh, one that we're going to keep attacking for a few minutes here. Constantine, you, you mentioned uh, in your very first answer about the idea of hunting for those big wins, uh, the, the big home runs. Is that um, – let me ask it this way. Is that something that you think as the, the sector expands and more types of players are looking to fund innovation, is that what we would call, at least in, in my industry, the, the power law, you know, hunting for that one – a company that returns the rest of the fund. Is that something that uh, you think is going to continue to be the case in the industry or you think? Uh, because, you know, like actually we are now living in a very interesting time where being a startup is becoming like a very fashionable thing. Yeah. So people, you know, like just common people, they don't want to work for somebody. A lot of people would like really to create startups. And of course, from these startups, you will have some sort Startups which have great ideas, which are successful, which have good teams, and others not. Uh, and if we speak about a successful team, and we speak, uh, uh, we also have the system where VCs are able to identify the right guys. When we have another very important question, why this startup team will work with this, that, or another VC? Because, you know, VCs uh, are notorious, you know, of squeezing out the founders and diluting their shares Plus, the company strategy is not always going the way how, how the founders want it. And uh, we cannot say which way is more effective. 
So for me, the question and, and it's kind of twofold, twofold sort. When on one side you have problem of identifying the right startup, on the other side we have a problem of matching startup teams with right investors. And I think this becoming bigger and bigger issue. Yeah, I think that's a really good point and actually something that you've uh, teased out here. I'd like to, to talk to Angela about. Angela, when you're thinking about the way the sector is going in terms of what happens after the check clears, um, you know, what can we as investors do to inflect the trajectory of the company? Do you think Constantine's onto something by saying the match between a, an investor and a company uh, matters beyond, uh, you know, the, the day of the well, the match is only the beginning, right? The, the the first step. So then in bio, we normally hope that the investors continue the adventure sort of with the starting team. And um, I guess the question is, how does the fund evaluate the company at the beginning when they are ready to fund the company versus after a year and how do they see the company move forward with the team? So those are questions that are more individual um, for each startup. And I guess uh, the other part of the question that we have um, as, as company builders and technology developers is basically what are the evaluation criteria for, for um, investors as they, how do they see team move forward? You know, some of the biotech topics are very challenging, such as allogeneic cell therapy or gene therapy. Um, so how do they evaluate um, the progress of the startup as they move forward from C to A to B to C. And, and actually, just a, a quick drill down on that, Angela. Um, obviously, in your industry, there's been a long-standing partnership between um, other kinds of funders of innovation, like governments uh, and universities. Um, do you think that that cross-sector collaboration is healthy today, or are you seeing more of the weight falling on the private investors? What's the dynamic in the cross-sector of funding? So we have the NIH, um, NSF funding for small business. These are grants. Um, some government in California, for example, there's the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. That's also a taxpayer based funding program for Regen Med. And so these are usually smaller amounts of grants and sometimes um, in the case of serum, the grants can be significant, um, eight figure for manufacturing and clinical development studies. Um, they are helpful, um, but I think a lot of times for the NIH, SBIR grants is what they're called. The funding amount is uh, too small to push an innovation from a very basic starting level all the way to commercial stage for therapeutic. And the Basically, the presumption at the beginning of the funding is that we're just getting you started and the VCs will come and pick up the rest of the investment requirements. So the investment amounts for, you know, seed funding is usually about 150K to 250K for bio program therapeutic development or device or diagnostics. And phase two, which is where they stop, is only at 1 million, 2.5 million range. So, so government expects that private industry and private investors will pick up after that. And I think everyone here knows that to develop a diagnostic or therapeutic or anything else requires a lot more funding than just $3 million to commercialize. Yes. Yes. I think we've, we've, we've all just lived through 18 months of watching very carefully the uh, drug discovery process. So, um mm -hmm. Andre, as as you're thinking about investing, are you also focused on the long tail of involvement in the startups, or is it really still focused on picking the? I think it's kind of both because you never know how the uh, the startups will look like in a couple of years or how the market will look like in a couple of years, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, in our fund, we want to create a strong and healthy relationship with startups in order to spend uh, three to five years 
before exit, and that's why we are very carefully of picking up a proper team because we want to uh, live our life in a fun and joyful way, and uh, that's why we uh, look at our work as a part of our life, and that's why we want to spend our life with people who want to change the world. We cannot change the world. We can help others to make uh, a big achievements like um, our friend uh, from uh, San Francisco. And uh, that's why we provide uh, money and uh, sometimes uh, uh, an advice. But I think the good relationship and the proper team uh, picking up is the good way of doing business uh, for VC. Thank you. And and Thomas, I, I specifically came to you last in this line of questions because I think so much of the air in this uh, uh, type of discussion is taken up by venture capital firms. Uh, and I'm curious to hear from you in terms of uh, the uh, the perspective that you would bring to this just this last few minutes from the corporate perspective and your... Uh, sure. Actually... Uh there was a couple of thoughts that like uh, <clears throat> picking up from the like previous discussion and, and comments. One was uh, like government funding. Uh, so I really like the model that, uh, and, and like also the role of universities. I really like the, the model and how things are working at Stanford and, and that Californian ecosystem. And I think that also we've made improvements also in the Nordics on, on that. And there's like governmental research institutions and these type of backing the, the like early steps and you know pre seed and seed stages and up to un, until I think Series A there's sufficient amount of capital funding here but then usually for Series B and Series C then uh, we're running short especially when we're talking about those larger rounds so then we need to go to Stockholm Berlin London or or you know west or east basically so that that's definitely a bottleneck in the local ecosystem and, and that just you know brought that into mind and then at that stage then you know both corporate venture uh, which has also grown quite significantly in the local ecosystem the previous five to ten years I'd say and then of course uh, VC funds and so there's a lot of uh, capital out there for the early stages but then not so much after you know like from series B onwards so this is definitely a big gap and that's also because you know as, as we all know that many LPs have a geographical focus so that can also hinder that if it doesn't reach out to the Nordics, then uh, how can we over, overcome the gap? So uh, I think I'd like to see in the future more corporations and more VCs also expanding. And I think that I've seen uh, some of the like most well-known uh, like Silicon Valley VCs also set up shop in London, uh, also in India, China. So I think that I think 500 startups was one of the first ones that really went like global on this. So I think that's been a really positive sign. And I think there's been more impressive and more interesting runs also coming up from Europe. So uh, it's also always a matter of perspective. And I, I think that this, it's, you know, traditionally been very, very US centric. But I think that now, because there's such, such strong, strong uh, traction also from Asia and, and also from Europe. So I think that's like, uh, you know, like we're coming to the same same level, like when it comes to sort of opportunities for growth. And I, I think Europe is a very quite, quite uh, difficult as as a home market because it's so fragmented, and it's not like you know 300 million consumers in, in one market. So, uh, and especially here, there's only five million reindeer. So it's <laughs> you can only like test test something, and then you need to really like scale fast and, and you know expand. Yeah, well, um, Thomas, I think you're right. It's been a U.S. centric industry and maybe even a city in the U.S. San Francisco has taken uh, so much of the airtime. One of the issues that's come from that is is I think we can all acknowledge a, um, a relatively homogenous 
uh, sector. A lot of people who look like me um, have received lots of funding, uh, both as investors and as entrepreneurs. And one of the things that I wanted to touch on this morning is as the future of funding innovation changes, uh, what is the role of companies that have an impact and that have diverse founding teams in creating a, a better future? And do we as investors have a responsibility to change the, the face literally and figuratively of the sector? Uh, unsurprisingly, let me start, Angela, with you. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on this topic? But I want to hear from it. Diversity and impact. Um, well, I guess it starts with how the funds choose their startups. Um, and what is the role of sustainable growth and how they evaluate different ideas. So in a way, um, the question I'm having actually is slightly different from what you're saying about the impact of diversity impact. I am more thinking about how does one choose startups according to traditional VC metrics or something new that they will adopt to choose uh, who's the funded startup that in their portfolio. So as an example is to think about AI algorithms that are always based on past data, past performance and past track record, so to speak. So if all the algorithms and evaluation metrics are based on past and history of performance, then there is an impossible and unavoidable bias that moves forward as you choose for the future because the assumption is that the past predicts the future. But if past is a homogeneous group of startups, of teams, of ideas, and that means moving forward, there will be also a homogeneous group. So the question I'm trying to ask everyone um, is essentially how do we not rely on the past to move forward into the future? Um, yeah, well, I think especially with an industry that's obsessed even before AI on pattern recognition, that's a really valid question. Um, uh, Gary, I'm curious to. No, no, absolutely. I think uh, obviously this is a very big and important topic, and and I would say we should view this both uh, whether it's uh, for profit or non-profit areas, uh, because. Uh, if you generally broadly look at right, uh, it needs to start there, right? If you look at the underprivileged, underserved, and diverse talent, right? Uh, how do you ensure they're getting a number one proper education? And there's one of the nonprofits I'm chairing next gen, which is focused on the cyber and getting those uh, students educating and getting them jobs or uh, capitalizing the entrepreneurial spirit out of them. So to me, it needs to start there. Then as uh, as we see the business people, uh, it should not just be a check mark. Okay, you know we are meeting these criteria. It has to come from within that we truly, really want to do that and establish uh, folks who can help you drive that. So, you know, as we we have just launched a fund too. One of the investment committee members, uh, I'm asking her to really deeply focus in this area, not only in terms of uh, uh, the founders uh, we pick because they are the right founders, also helping the portfolio companies understand uh, the importance uh, of diversity, inclusion, and how they can create an impact. It's a journey, and uh, it, it cannot just happen overnight. Obviously, in the U.S., with some of the events which happened, uh, has spurred up, right, for people to really uh, pay more more attention. But it's a journey, and it's a collective uh, teamwork which is required to move the needle. Uh, uh, I, I could keep going, but I want to make sure everybody has enough time. <laughs> no, it's certainly not something that gets fixed uh, overnight. Overnight, Thomas, what are your thoughts, uh, given that you've kind of straddled the sectors? Are you seeing the diversity, inclusion, and impact conversation? Uh, sure thing. Very important and topical, uh, I think. Uh, I'd, I'd like to say, and then, you know, this is maybe a humble brag, which is a term that was introduced at Slush. I think Finns traditionally are very bad at or, or Nordics on, on complementing each other or, or, you know, saying positive things. We tend to be a bit <laughs> on the negative side of things. But uh, I'd like to say that Nordics is leading the way in, in this, this area. And uh, I think it's something that, like, equally in the society, like gender equality and these type of factors are, are quite equal. Of course, there's still a pay gap and 
things to, of course, develop. But I'd say that uh, Nordics is, is showing the way in this and then something that like you can really see in the founding teams, especially in a bit younger teams. There's a lot of female founders, uh, gender balanced teams, and this is something that's really taken into account. There's uh, a lot of friends and, and people I know are also doing you know, accounting, so there might be then an analytics companies that are, you know, doing this type of accounting for that, how are the teams and, and like not only for startups, but also for, for bigger teams. So I think that it's, it's like you, you see it in the culture. It's a very hot topic. It's been discussed on a weekly basis. And uh, I think it's, it's just, you know, stemming from the culture, but also because it's a global phenomenon as well. So I think that the locals have reacted to this, this, uh, uh, really in a well, uh, well way. And also slush, one of the, the large tech conferences there has also, uh, I think brought this up theme, uh, very, uh, proactively in the past years. So I think that it's coming from the different levels. So really happy to see this, this trend going. And then, uh, let's say that the, the projects that I've been involved with, we've tried to in recruiting the talent and building the team really just focus on finding the best talent, but also broadening, like broadening the horizons bit, because I think you can just, you know, uh, I think uh, what you said, Oliver, in the beginning that, you know, you know, people tend to see their world through their own lenses. So it's quite easy to just, you know, have your own bias and your own perspective and then hire the people that look, look like you and think like you. So you really need to challenge yourself in order to, to, to be able to unlock the, the talent around you. And it can sometimes come surprising uh, uh, places. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, I think that's uh, very well taken. Uh, Andre, uh, you were a, a bit of an unabashed uh, uh, fan of some of the, uh, the existing modes of venture capital. Do you think some of those will have to change to accommodate for, uh, you know, more diverse entrepreneurs and, and more impactful companies? Or are we on the... I think that we are on the right track anyway. Uh, for example, in our portfolio of projects, almost uh, more than half have uh, female co-founders. And it uh, wasn't on purpose because the diversity is good as itself. And uh, projects uh, with uh, diversity in founders are more efficient. And that's why even with the current infrastructure, we can support uh, projects with gender diversity and uh, other kind of uh, diversity as well. It's my opinion. It's uh, all about people, not about uh, infrastructure or instruments. Sure. No, I totally understood. And Constantine, why don't you bring us home on this topic, and then we'll have one last thing to discuss before. <clears throat> well, uh, you know, I, I will speak about Switzerland. Uh, you know, Switzerland is a very traditional country, and uh, in this country, women got voting rights, I don't know, in the 60s or 70s, <laughs> just for the surprise. <clears throat> but having said this, now uh, diversity and uh, Women leaders is a very important topic. It's supported actually a lot by government and also by investment community. So it's becoming a very fashionable thing, for sure. But for me, when we speak about diversity, you know, it's uh, also a little broad thing because for me, diversity so should also include free flow of capital, free flow of technology, and free flow of resources. But I think here we're closing down. You know, like look at this polarized. Um, uh, conditions and polarized uh, world. Imagine like a uh, Russian technology company entering, uh, let's say, European market or as versa Chinese company going to the United States. More and more restrictions are built. And I think like this is the biggest diversity concern we'll have. Human diversity, we as uh, you know, managers will resolve. But how will resolve political and economical diversities? I think that's a great way to, to bring us to a close. So um, I, I want to pose one final question in rapid answers from all of our panelists uh, for the last five minutes that we have here. And that question is, and I, I think so much of the conversation that we have around the world today is maybe a little bit pessimistic or, uh, uh, you know, focused on the problems. Uh, we get a very exciting topic to discuss today. So I wanted to end with the question in, you know, 
uh, you know, 45 seconds or so from each person. Uh, is it a, a good time for innovation uh, in the world? And what is the thing that you are most excited about uh, in the innovation sector in terms of building a better future. And as you think about that, because I'm surprising you with the question, I just want to focus our uh, wonderful uh, audience on some of the things we've heard today. So while I think about that, um, you know, just to focus in on the fact that we've heard the, the jury's out a little bit on the old versus the new systems of funding. Um, but we are certainly excited about uh, not only new VC approaches, but other approaches from other sectors uh, and the collaboration between sectors. We're excited also about the fact that uh, uh, geographic uh, uh, diversity in the sector is increasing. It's more than just San Francisco or the U.S. We're seeing a global sector really emerge here. Uh, we're moving away perhaps from some of the old models and mythologies, the pattern recognition, uh, which is particularly important uh, when we think about, you know, algorithmic approaches to a funding innovation. We have to make sure that those are fair and that take things into account and so many other things that, that emerge in this discussion. So it's been a really robust discussion. So without further ado, just, you know, is it a good time for innovation and what's the thing that excites you the most? And a, a quick answer uh, Thomas, would, uh, can we? Definitely. So I'd like to say that quantum computing is something that really excites me, and I'm happy to say that there's one of the like leading projects coming from Finland, IQM uh, Computers. Uh, I know the the investors and the founding team, very solid team from the university, and and I think there's a handful of, of similar uh, great teams uh, globally. So I I would be watching uh, that space very carefully in coming years. And awesome. very optimistic about that. Excellent. Constantine. Uh, on my side, uh, I'm very excited for the new uh, trend, a new buzzword, which is called nature-like technologies, which is going a little bit opposite of digitalization and going back to natural fundamentals. And I think we could have a lot of nature-inspired or nature-like innovation. And this is a very exciting topic for me. Fantastic. Uh, Gary, how to me, right, uh, there's always time for innovation. Innovation never stops, right? Uh, uh, you eat, breathe, and think innovation. I think it's uh, all about how you converse things, right? Uh, you know, it's very interesting how Gen Z is uh, thinking about innovation and they're disrupting, right? So to me, in this new world, you got to, uh, you know, have the Gen Z part of the the incubation journey, right? Combining them with the gray hair, right? So they can avoid the pitfalls we have faced. Working with the, the corporate organizations because every company gets very focused on shareholder value and uh, their periscopes become more and more limited, right? To me, the, the new model is how do you converse these uh, aspects uh, and accelerate the value, Uh not take two years to build an MVP, you know, how do you mitigate the risk while accelerating the MVP? And it's all about converging all these uh, aspects. To me, uh, cyber is an area which will continue to be a big one. You see, see me wearing this true you, right? Uh, digital identity will become more and more critical. 90% of your cyber attacks now are due to compromised credentials. So that's going to continue to be a, a big, big area. But again, innovation never stops. Absolutely. Uh, Andre, how about you? And then Angela will ask you to close the session. <laughs> I am completely agree with Gary. Innovation never stops. And I think that today is the best day for innovation. And uh, for tomorrow will be even more innovative t t times. And I am looking for those uh, t t tomorrow days in order to support absolutely new, unpredictable innovation, which will come from San Francisco, Ukraine, India, China, Russia, or anywhere else. Fantastic. And Angela, you have the last word. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so we are excited in bio. I mean, there are many, many areas of um growth and development. I'm particularly excited about the cell and gene therapy space uh, because it is the newest modalities for medicine and other um, medical um, modalities such as mRNAs, therapeutics, as you have seen from the vaccine development um, 
for the past year. This is also a new area of work, lots of RNA-based medicines. So these are all great areas of innovation. And they're um, hopefully all get funded. All the great ideas will be funded and uh, pursued. Excellent. Well, we're at time. Thank you to everyone in the audience for tuning in and uh, and for those who watch this stream later and to uh, these five wonderful panelists. Thank you for your insights, for all you're doing to build a better future by funding and creating innovation. With that, take care. Enjoy the rest of your day, evening or morning. Thank you. Thanks. Take care, everyone.